All right, 6 o'clock. Uh, I'm going to call the meeting to order. Let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance, as per usual. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, roll call finds all present. And we'll start out with the administrative report, teaching and learning. You are up. Hi. Hi. <laughs> So I wanted to talk more in depth about the READ Act. I know Kevin had shared with you a little bit about it. Um, I am genuinely excited for the legislation. I think I'm one of very few, but I'm genuinely excited. I think our teachers deserve high quality professional development. Our students deserve access to high quality materials. Um, and so, to paint the picture of why I think it's important for TCU, um, third grade this year, we provide, we give our students the CBM reading assessment. So, three times a year, our students grades one through four are given this test fall, winter, spring. It's three passages, they're tested for a minute long, and they, um, are assessed on their accuracy and their automaticity, so how smooth they're reading the passage. Um, and so this spring we ended up at 63% meeting the benchmark in third grade and 51% of students district-wide, so grades one through four, hitting the benchmark. What I really want to clarify is I think when we hear students meeting the benchmark, we're like, great, they're hitting proficiency. Um, but if you hit a benchmark as a student, you are either in two categories. You're either some <coughs> risk or you're on a college pathway, and that's how it's labeled through FAST. Um, so if you're a student who hit college pathway, you are in between the 70th and 99th percentile. If you are hitting at some risk, you are between the 40th and 69th percentile. And so when we think of 50% of our students are hitting a benchmark, are meeting that benchmark, really we have 50% of our kids are 40th percentile to 99th percentile. And though I believe that not everyone chooses to go to college at some point in their life, whether they're 18 or 56, they might decide that they wanna go and like further their education um, and so I think we have a really great opportunity to continue to move kids whether or not they choose that path. Um, and so we're really looking at, I'm really looking at the students who are hitting this one subtest. There's multiple subtests. We really, at the end of the day, we want them to excel. They deserve to excel if they choose to like, do that at some point one day. And so for the READ Act, our students have to hit grade level reading. And one of those things that we're expected to do is provide them a screener three times a year. Um, and with the READ Act, they're required, we're required to use one of the required assessment tools that MDE approves. Um, and one of them was FastBridge, which we already use. And so there's multiple subtests, some of them they look at multiple different pieces and components of reading. And so with the READ Act, there are requirements. Um, one of them is the screener and how we universally screen our students. Um, Evidence-based curriculum, training and structured literacy. Um, structured literacy is, we hear it as science of reading, but it's a structured approach to reading. Um, we need to employ a district literacy lead um, by July of 2025, and then a local literacy plan needs to be developed and posted by June 15th on the website. So those are the big requirements, and with that, there's lots of little ones. Um, our universal screening, like I mentioned, is FastBridge. So as I'm looking at data and reporting to you, it's something that will 
be looking at closely. Um, like I said, there's lots of different tests. Grades K through three have to be tested three times a year. Two of those are in the first six weeks of the school year and at the end of the last six weeks of the school year, they recommend that the winter test, you screen them all within about two to three weeks just because six weeks is a wide range of time when it comes to instruction. Um, in grades four through 12, we have to have a plan on how we're going to screen for dyslexia. Um, we kind of have a plan at the moment and what we've historically been doing our interventionists get information from our classroom teachers and based off of data via FastBridge and the interventions that they host, they use a Nessie screener to see if they present any sort of risk for dyslexia. Um, where we struggle with is that it's not a consistent system from building to building and then we don't communicate well when it comes to communicating with families, whether or not, like how that data looks for our students. And so for the READ Act, we're required um, to send out information. Those, each time we screen, we have to send out information to parents about how well their students did, if they hit grade level or not. And so I'm writing, um, documentation for family so it's standard across the board if they're placed in an intervention by an interventionist we have to monitor and report out on that data to families as well um, and then if we screen them for dyslexia we have to do the same um, curriculum I you know I'm giving you a lot of information I promise I'll take questions um, curriculum and intervention so MDE vetted the curriculum. We aren't required to utilize one of those, but it's vetted. So it kind of saves us lots of time and money vetting resources. Um, and they've been really transparent about how they've vetted their resources. And it's exactly how we would have vetted our resources. And so we're moving forward with adopting EL Education K3 next year. EL Education is a comprehensive curriculum. So we adopted Hegarty this year for skills block. Hegarty only hits phonemic awareness. And so something that our teachers really struggled with this year was around comprehension. Like they did their phonemic awareness. What happens if you replace the O with the I? Um, but when it came to students reading and writing longer text our teachers and principals admitted that they were deficit in giving that instruction um, and so el education is supporting them with that during their foundational skills time they'll still continue to use hegarty for their phonemic awareness piece um, so students continue to get that part of structured literacy um, el education is comprehensive in the fact that it hits all of the new Minnesota standards, but that also includes writing, and so that's not a separate part of the day. It's really embedded. Um, it also embeds our science and social studies standards. We're not, we are not, not, emphasize on not, replacing that with our science and social studies work, but it's to help leverage and support that work. Um, but it's really robust. The principals and instructional coaches and I took a trip to Wisconsin schools to see how they're implementing it. Um, and they echoed a lot of wonderful things. This is really rigorous. This is really engaging. Um, and our principals and instructional coaches are really excited to take on that endeavor. And I'll be working closely to make sure it's being monitored well. And I'll be reporting to and how well it's going. Um, we also have to really work closely with our intervention process with the READ Act. So we have to follow Minnesota's MTSS structure. And so we have to evaluate it using their form and really thinking about that tier one support. Our new TOSA, Melanie Reese, will be helping me with monitoring and evaluating the data from our inter intervention and making sure that we're following it 
in a standardized way to support our tier two and tier three students. Um, the last piece, which I think is what our teachers really love to hear about, is our professional development. Again, we have to follow one of three resources that MDE vetted, letters, core, or OLA, O-L, the and symbol L-A, they pronounce it OLA though, and then carry all were the three choices. We went with core for a variety of reasons. Um, we're training our three instructional coaches to be trainers in-house, and so that gives us a, a lot of flexibility on how long we provide this training for. So instead of getting it done in 18 weeks, we could do it in a year and a half. And so by July 1 of 2026, this is new in legislation, we have to have all of our phase one educators trained hitting 80%. So that's 80 teachers at TCU. So our professional development days will be taken up next year. We're looking at their PLC, CLT times to really support them with that. Um, our instructional coaches are excited, but again, there's still a lot of support that's needed to make sure our teachers feel like this is worth their time. And so we really wanna make sure we're embedding it into the day. Um, we were originally gonna start in August of this upcoming school year, but with the new legislation, we're gonna start in semester two. So January of 2025, because we have extra time instead of getting it done in a year, that way we can really focus on starting the other aspects of the READ Act and then start getting our teachers trained so they're not overloaded and burned out quickly by semester two. Um, so that is a very brief synopsis of the READ Act. What questions do you have for me? How does this affect our curriculum cycle with reading? Like, <clears throat> where are we on the cycle there as far as is it going to, like, we're doing not only purchasing new curriculum for that, but the training, all of that that goes along with it. Because I know we did reading not too long ago, right? Yep. Yeah, so when we, so after COVID, our curriculum cycle got messed up. And so we're needing to catch up. Like we, we're missing, there's lots of gaps missing in what should have been adopted versus what hasn't been adopted. Um, and so there's not a clear, as we're planning out, what I'm looking at is when our standards need to be implemented and not starting over, but trying to catch up on where um, we should be, but it's, going to take yeah. multiple years to catch up. Yeah, COVID, COVID threw that off quite a bit. Because we were in the math process. We were in math when COVID mm -hmm. hit, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. math expressions was adopted. Yeah. Right, uh, and I knew all of yeah. that. Yeah. But Len and I were just talking about that today, so we still all have to figure out if that's what we're going to continue to use moving forward. Uh, if that's the case, then making sure we do the proper trainings on that math expressions um, and then fully implement it. It hasn't been fully but we purchased it. Yeah. Correct. Okay. And when I asked our teachers and principals on what, who's utilizing it versus who's not, it's a very wide range of responses. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Mm -hmm. And so something that we've chatted about next year is that when we look at implementing something, follow implementation science, we're working with the rubric and really making sure we're monitoring it and that our principals are supporting the cause and what happens if they, what happens if a teacher is not utilizing it, what does that look like? So we're being good stewards of our funds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we need to have an alignment across the district. Oh, for sure. And yeah, if that's, that's not the case and we have different people doing different things and we're not aligning. Because uh, math was one of those big yes. missing buckets. Yep. Yeah. So we got that a little bit all over the place. And with the adoption, like I mentioned, with the adoption of Hegarty, we're missing like 75% of the standards. So our teachers are then curating the rest of the curriculum. And it's not, it's not going well. EL education is K-8. And so there's a fabulous scope and sequence 
all the way up through eighth grade. Um, I think when we continue to use multiple different publishers, what we're really creating is those publishers are using different curriculum writers where we're causing gaps in unfinished teaching. Is Unfinished teaching is happening because of it. And so we really want to make sure that, you know, next year is K-3, but what happened, we sell fourth, eighth ELA that hasn't been touched either. Um, and new standards are have to be in effect in two school years. It's just a, the frustrating piece of all of this is that it's not supposed to be, you know, until 20, what, 26, but all of the time and efforts that you put into it above and beyond that, it could definitely change again. Now you have funds, you have time invested in all of this. It's just, it, we just keep piling more new things on and never be able to really focus on what the kids truly need because yeah. um, we're always teaching and training, well, which is a good thing. I mean, don't get me wrong by saying that, but it's just new material all of the time. It is, yeah. and they change the standards, so it yeah. always naturally throws some of the curriculum development okay. out, um, and the cycles kind of get washed away too because they'll all of a sudden implement right. new science standards when they want to, right. um, and which means, which means you have to then change curriculum, so then you got these new uh, EL standards with the READ Act coming out, so that shifts everything. Districts can only pay for so much curriculum, right. so sometimes you got to jump ship, start over, and then and that takes four or five years to reprocess. And with the adoption of next year's with EL education, we made sure that the standards that we need to implement <coughs> in two school years match that. And so we're just moving ahead with it, moving forward. So we'll have those same standards for the next eight years, technically. Because the goal is always to make sure that our kids are educated to move on, mm -hmm. you know, whatever shape or form they want to move on after graduation and uh it's sad that we're already putting a label on them <laughs> oh <laughs> at such a young age at such a young age yeah. i know i know you said you were one of the few that i'm paraphrasing that liked the read act what, what's the pushback <laughs> otherwise other than what yep I'm i think some, some <laughs> districts are frustrated that when they have vetted some resources their resources are no longer aligned and so with EL education we can use our read act funds to cover EL education if we aren't utilizing it for other things like staffing and things like that there also is supposed to be a reimbursement process that opens up next spring and EL education is one of them on that list and so even if it's a partial reimbursement like that's still money on us, but for people who've been using things like Hegarty, they won't qualify for that partial reimbursement. And so they're frustrated with that. So they, whereas with the Read Well by Third Grade, that literacy aid incentive, though, was earmarked. Ha I mean, so people are navigating that. Um, some people are frustrated about funding when it comes to our professional development. They want to offer letters to their staff. Letters is a Cadillac science <coughs> of reading training, and that requires lots and lots of different resources that larger districts have that others don't. Um, it feels really mandated, but like I shared, I really think our teachers deserve to be trained and receive really high quality materials. Um, but people think of this as a chore and that is something that could be really positive for students and community. Yeah, I think a lot of the dislike, there's so much ebb and flow to it yet mm -hmm. that I, I think uh, for the whole, it's can we have some a little more finality on this because it was 24, 25, and then it was 25, 26, and now it's 26, 27 when all staff has to be trained uh, due to some funding issues at the, at the state level when it first came out. So, and like Elida was saying, as some of the bigger districts already had curriculums purchased, mm -hmm this year and last year uh, that now <coughs> completely new curriculums which means all new training which there isn't funding for the professional development side of it which they're going to fund for the the academic piece of the curriculum so it's a little bit all over the place yet as far as what truly is happening with it uh, but a lot is right if you embrace it uh, there's some really perks to it but there's still some unknowns with funding and so we're working really hard to TCUify it in the best way. We're really excited for our instructional coaches to become trainers 
so they can support our teachers and exactly what they need and we aren't really tied to that 18 week timeline for professional development that will help us tremendously and the workload of our teachers will be less which is great our teachers are really excited they got a glimpse of structured literacy through the phonemic awareness piece of Hegarty this year and they're excited to learn more they're genuinely realizing that some of the things they have been doing are not at grade level and aren't hitting the standards and they're excited to make sure there's consistency across the board and from building to building and grade level to grade level there's a solid scope and sequence million dollar question what happens when they're not reading at grade level if they're not reading at grade level that's where our mtss system will come in to play i did not have time to continue the work um, that was left and so starting in the fall we're going to pick that back up but we really need to focus on what our intervention is doing and what happens when a student is when a student is not at grade level they're missing the screening continuously when do we flag in an interventionist and the fidelity of an intervention is a process that needs to be smoothed out at TCU sometimes they're in an intervention for a few days and then they're exited out and I though that's great that should be something that's celebrated we need to think of intervention as something that has a little more fidelity and data and reporting to our families and I'm not that is a I should that's a, a very small exception to what's happening but there's lots of questions with our additions of interventionists this year and so really smoothing that out is going to be a year-long journey next year which is why Melanie will be helping me with that you mentioned some statistics at the beginning I kind of lost, lost me on those a little bit could you run over those again yes yeah, so this year at the beginning I'm to focus on third grade the CBM reading assessment which will be a required screen for next year we'll screen them three times this fall our third grade students 54 percent hit the benchmark so when a student hits the benchmark they fall 40 percent to 99 they fall between the 44th and 99th percentile we so 50 sorry say that again because that's a really bizarre range of percentiles 40th for the 90th but you're looking at yep average to superior yeah that's a like I'm just curious why it's banded that way so that is what fast bridge norms for us that's their okay. guidelines and so I will share with you 51% of our students in grades 1 through 4 hit benchmark this year in spring which is great 50% half of our student mm -hmm. population hit it but that means they fell in like nationwide percentile of 44 40th to 99th percentile which is just <laughs> like I would rather say like all of our TCU students are <laughs> hitting 70% or higher like I would love to say that um, 70% like or 70th percentile okay. and above I would love to say our TCU students are hitting okay but most so that's an impossibility though isn't it I mean if you look at a bell I don't mean that yeah. no if you look at the bell curve 50% mm -hmm. if you standard bell curve 50% of the population falls between the 25th and the 75th percentile rank yeah and so by definition like if I'm just I'm just trying to clarify like what the expectation is because that's almost not fair you know what I mean that's what I'm trying to yeah. understand I, I know what I 100% understand what you're saying but I think that our students can like if we were comparing to national average okay so you they're comparing to national average correct. not not like TCU okay. numbers or they're comparing to national averages okay and so like for fifth grade by the end of the year they're supposed to read 163 words per minute mm -hmm to hit benchmark okay sorry nope you're <laughs> um, 
Th that's, that's what I'm questioning. Well, when you average out all the states and all the kids and you look at low level lying states, that naturally brings that down. Just saying. I'm just saying that 40% seems really low. If and you, took, so, if you took the top 10 states and put that in there, that would probably be a lot higher. Though I understand the bell curve, I, that's where I'm questioning. Like, I don't want our students hitting 40%. I want them hitting like 60%, 70%. Percent or percentile? Percentile, Okay, sorry. so when I do evaluations, I don't want to get bogged down. What's considered average is between the 25th and the 75th percentile. Anything above the 75th percentile is high average. If you get above 85th to 99, that's considered superior range. So the vast majority of a population will fall between 25th and 75th percentile rank. And then you have the outliers on either side. So that's why I was just trying to get clarification on how statistics, and that's just statistics. They're going to, that it's, a, it's going to be a standard distribution. Sorry, I'm going down a rabbit hole. But that's why I wanted some clarification. I will present the <laughs> bell curve. I mean, because when you look at the data, it's presented on a bell curve. Yeah. Um, but not all of our, like, not all of our grade levels fall like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, there's. Right. Um, I think what will really happen is, is Minnesota will take how they're doing this and pull this data out and do so much comparing of people and st or students to students and districts to districts across yeah. Minnesota versus national mm -hmm. that that's where it's going to be going and okay. then funding and support sets support resources then will be divvied out based on where are we lacking okay. as a state because it's truly about how does Minnesota compare and if, if, you, if you look at the top down we want to yeah. look at student numbers in third grade we went from 65 students hitting benchmark to 77 students hitting benchmark. So we gained 12 students okay. hitting proficiency, basically. Mm -hmm. And what I would love is more students to hit that. Okay. I wasn't questioning it, like I said, I was just going to clarify what they were aiming at. <laughs> so, sorry. Okay. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lada. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> do, we have, do we have the principal's update or no? Yeah, we do have it in there. Got it. Okay. You want me to read the whole thing? Or? What's that? Do you don't want me to read it, do you? No. <laughs> do you want me to go over it or no? You don't, you don't need to. Okay. Usually it's in there to read. Got it. All right. Next, I will seek a motion. Uh, to approve the consent agenda, excuse me, to approve the agenda. Pardon me. We'll make the motion. I'll second. All right, I have a motion by Marsha Franek, seconded by Christopher Vlasak to approve the agenda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion's passed. Seven zero. <coughs> Next, we have the consent agenda, which includes the approval of minutes from the May 13th, 2024 board meeting. Um, under personnel, we have employment ending Jenny Walskog, teacher on special assignment, Renea Herblicka, cook's helper, Maisie Anderson, paraprofessional, Danielle Kalina, paraprofessional, Melissa Bell, special education, Karen Rohrbach, special education, Dane Booth, special education, Katrina Schwartz, counseling administrative assistant, Jean Kopp, uh, director of business services, Sarah Adams, JV tennis coach, Peter Kriger, High School Knowledgeable Advisor, Brian Michael, National Honor Society. Under new hires, we have Mallory Blaschko, elementary teacher. Rebecca uh, Lillenberg, speech language pathologist. Bridget Caven, speech language pathologist, step adjustment. Brooke Sani, speech language pathologist. Shelby Voigt, speech language pathologist. Mackenzie Linehan, J junior high volleyball coach. Uh, Liesl Nolan, J junior high volleyball coach. Sarah Adams, head tennis coach. Corey Beasel, assistant tennis coach. Tanner Hadler, junior high football coach. Jacob Galipsky, assistant football coach. Jenna Gullix, the center kids zone summer site lead. Danielle Kalina, Montgomery kids zone site lead. Alejandra Villanueva, administrative assistant. Under leave of absence, we have Danielle Kalina, Kid Zone Supervisor, uh, and Brooke Sani, Speech Language Pathologist. 
Uh, we have performance responsibilities for the Director of Business Services. Under contract, we have Director of Business Services and then substitute temporary rates of pay. Recommend, recommendation for tenure under TCU High School, we have Katie Keogh, Don Markison, Amanda McCall, Michael Reeser, Beta Thalman for TCU Lee Center, Melissa Gettle, Isabel Lieb, Natalie Mesker, Lauren Sylvester, Elise Bauerfiend. Under TCU Longsdale, we have Michaela Cowan, TCU Montgomery, Jared Van Dorp, Sally Eichen, Courtney Plummer, Lisa Hafes, Special TCU Special Services, Christina Grasser, Emily Irvin, Amanda McCall. And we have approval of the bills approval of bills in the amount of $696,716.96 and the finance report. I will seek a motion. I'll make a motion. I'll second. I have a motion by Kevin Huber, seconded by Hillary Birdsell to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion's passed, 7-0. Under open forum, I see there's no one on for the open forum, so we'll move on to informational items. Uh, the QCOMP end of year report. Jeff will, Jeff will speak on that. Okay. All right. Um, we had a great year again with our uh, QCOMP program. I uh, great success teachers going in and through the PDSA process really diving into lots of strategies uh, and looking for ways to help our students grow as well as their own personal growth their professional growth so it's been a uh, you know as we look at our Q crop process it, it, we've had it for a while now right we've been working our way through uh, looking at how do we plan how do we study how do we do and how do we act right in the end uh, and what do those actions entail as far as our growth as we continue to move forward? And so our PDSA process that we implemented last year has really uh, continued to help our staff do that. If you kind of continue to scroll down, um, our program hasn't changed. The leadership opportunities are still the, what have been. Uh, we have, you know, our four site instructional leaders as well as myself as a facilitator and then over 30 plus instructional coaches that are out there helping our teachers in the trenches day to day. So uh, that's pretty normal. Uh, we did set out a survey to kind of just uh, look at how was our implementation going. Uh, and we, as we've, as Matt Flugum set up before me, uh, really tiering at that four to five, the, the very high end, 80%, 81% again. So we're really staying even there. Interesting part, I just kind of was curious, like what would it do if I brought the threes in and it jumps up to 99.8? You know, so it, we see that the number of teachers who are seeing average to above average impact in their classroom of doing these philosophies is through the roof. Our teachers are seeing the benefit of doing what they're doing. So that's pretty cool. I just thought that was just part of the, of the data that we've collected. Um, remember our process overall has, is all about the collaboration amongst our staff and how much our teachers can gain from each other uh, and grow from each other as well as, you know, as we bring in new things through the READ Act through, and we get our teacher leaders out there doing it, they can come back and they can help ourselves, right? We, we can train ourselves and provide those things in there. So that's really a big part of that portfolio process is again, learning. We've had you know, our, our uh, interventionists doing staff meetings where there have been trainings going on and teachers are able to then use that in their classroom and talk about how they've implemented strategies from those trainings with their students and how that's then helped them grow, help their students grow across the board. So again, it's just been a, a great learning process for us. Um, this is a review. So what kind of strategies have we been hitting on? Uh, anywhere from uh, student self-assessment, reading press ideas, AVID, uh, again, pushing forward, academic language vocabulary. Vocabulary was a big push for almost all of our buildings uh, this year as part of their building goals. So that's just kind of some of the big heavy hitters. Um, our playbooks that were established last year they avidized over the summer so really kind of making that common language so teachers could start seeing the, the links that are out in those playbooks and then a lot of our teachers diving into those and using those strategies in their classrooms uh, you can scroll out to artifacts um, part of our requirements for QCOMP is the teachers have to uh, have a live observation 
So that's done by a peer, not by an administrator. So a peer coach comes in, they have a live observation. Uh, they're required to collect data and to be able to analyze that data. A lot of them use stack and sorts of all sorts. Uh, they, they, I've seen everything from percentages to qualitative, quantitative observations taking place. So uh, they're required to do that and to talk about how that changes their practices in their classroom. And also looking at just the the research that they're doing. Like what are your what is your learning goal for this year? What are you, what are you planning on gaining through the, the work that you're doing and throughout the year? So those are all really a big heavy hitters within our QCOM program. Um, just a little chart of the dirt of the work that they've done with the, the survey results where again you can see where I said like the 99% really comes up uh, that green, purple and orange coming together. You know, it's not quite that much of that one, but you can kind of see uh, where we're at there. Uh, overall, our job embedded, like, like that's our ultimate goal, right? We talk, I already talked about that a little bit. You know, that individualized coaching. This is the one of the things that, as we look through the comments that they left, because they had the ability as they filled out their surveys to talk to us about, like, what do you see as your benefits and where do you think we need to change for the years ahead? And it was very, very evident about how, uh, as we changed up two years ago now, to kind of mixed groups where we were no longer science teachers aren't just coaching the science teachers, right? We have a wide variety of teachers entering classrooms and they said they love it. Like the, the ability to, to see other points of view and being able to get those to come into their classroom and, and talk about, well, gosh, I just observed a kindergarten classroom. They were doing stations. Gosh, you know, even as an eighth grade teacher, I can do stations. Is it gonna look different? Yeah, it's gonna look different. But the, the, the philosophies, the, the strategies that are being used are even able to be accented there and, and so we're all growing together and some of the things that maybe we would have forgotten about are coming back into some of our classrooms as high leverage strategies so that's pretty cool to see and that comes through those coaching conversations you know I, I talked to we had our a wrap-up meeting with our coaches here just last week and they were talking about how much they learned from having the conversations with their fellow colleagues and it just as them as they get to see all of them <laughs> like you know like hey they're working on this strategy oh, gosh you know I'm gonna use that in mine, and it, it, like they're just picking the, the highlights out of them. So it's pretty cool to see that going on. That's I just kind of reviewing what we kind of already talked about. So questions behind our QCOM program. I know we've had it going for a while. Did you have 100% buy-in from the staff this year? We had almost. We had one that uh, felt like started it, but then fell off the the uh, wagon even after multiple attempts. But overall, all the rest were on board. There's always one. <laughs> Last year we had 100%. We're hoping That's to get this year, but <laughs> but all but one met Perfect. the requirements. It's doing what it's supposed to do. Then yeah, seems like it is. Yes. We okay, continue to grow. You know, there's always areas of change and things that teachers are. Hey, we like to tweak this. Like to mm -hmm. tweak that and. You know, we're working on those, but yeah, overall it's being very successful. Good. Thank you. All right. Yep, appreciate Thanks, it. Jeff. All right. Your enrollment. Yeah, I guess we would call it year close to year. End of year. All right. Um, enrollment. Stay about the same. Uh, every grade stays the same except for two seniors, which is sometimes a little bit natural towards the uh, end of the school year. So, uh, process of potentially still finishing, but just didn't finish. So otherwise the enrollment has stayed the same over months. Okay. So nothing nothing surprising there. And we actually will see potentially that go up uh, as we've added a few more students on recently. So um, once that gets in the database going into July, we'll see where that goes. Sounds good. So, yeah. Committee updates, finance. Chris or Marsha, you wanna? I don't have it. Uh, let's see, Finance Committee met a couple weeks back. Uh, we discussed an update on the fiscal year 25 budget, which will be presented later. Uh, reviewed steps to address district deficit spending. Uh, reviewed the parking lot abatement bond sale update and tax impact. Uh, we assessed potential future locker room solution at the high school and funding for that. And then provided an update on property sale status of the three lots. And facilities. I don't think we had a meeting. We didn't. No, we just have a meeting today. We didn't have a meeting. Okay. Um, obviously, 
mostly about the parking lots and uh, primary. Yep. And there's really nothing updated. We talked about primary quite a bit last meeting okay. with you guys. Yep. All right. New business. We have uh, donations. Chris, you want to? Be resolved that the school board of independent school district number 2905 accepts with appreciation the following gifts or donations and permits their use as designated by the donors. Rice County United Way for Lonsdale Preschool Scholarships, $4,000 for 2024-25 and 2526. Friends and Bank and Trust for BP, BPA National Leadership Conference, $1,000. Montgomery Foundation for BPA National Leadership Conference for $500. Lonsdale Lions Club BPA National Leadership Conference $250. $250. Inspire Services LLC BPA National Leadership Conference $100. Montgomery Knights of Columbus for a Community Ed Summer Rec Program $500. Sam Chatterden Family Lee Center Student Projects $25. Sheriff's Mountain Posse. Center Student Pro Projects $100, Woeful Construction, Lee Center Student Projects $50, Lee Center American Legion for Lee Center Student Projects $100, Montgomery Fire Department for Montgomery Lee Center Student Projects $2,800, and Montgomery American Legion, a new American flag and stand for the Montgomery site. All right, I'll need a second. I'll second it. Marsha. All right, I have a res resolution introduced by Chris Blussock, seconded by Marsha Franek. This will be a roll call vote. Hillary? Yes. Marsha? Yes. Chris? Yes. I'm a yes. Trevor? Yes. Kevin? Yes. And Cindy? Yes. Resolution is passed. Yes. Seven, nothing. <coughs> Next is the land sale resolution. This is uh, Tri-City United School District number 2905 land sale resolution, whereas the Tri-City United School District 2905 has determined that the sale of certain real property owned by the district is in the best interest of the district and its constituents, and whereas the Tri-City United School District number 2905 has followed all legal requirements and procedures pertaining to the sale of real property as outlined by state and local regulations. Whereas the sale of the property will generate revenue that can be allocated towards projects and purposes within our school district. Whereas the Tri-City United School District number 2905 has reviewed all offers and conducted due diligence regarding the sale of the property. Be resolved that the Tri-City United School District number 2905 Board of Education hereby approves the sale of that part of the Northeast Quarter of the Northwest Quarter of Section 4, Township 111, North Range 23, West Leesore County, Minnesota, described below. Perfect. All right, I'll need a second. I'll second it. Okay. Didn't you, didn't, didn't Kevin just? I'm going to second it for the third time. <laughs> Oh, did you I'll say it? Kevin, Kevin did. Speak Kevin, up. speak up next time, okay? I'll use my indoor voice. Uh, we all know you don't have to. <laughs> okay. I have a land sale uh, resolution introduced by Chris Russock, seconded by Kevin Huber. <laughs> this will be a roll call vote. Uh, Hillary? Yes. Marsha? Yes. Chris? Yes. I'm a yes. Trevor? Yes. Kevin? Yes. And Cindy? Yes. Motion's passed, 7 0. Okay. Next up is coaches and advisors, 24-25 coaches and advisors. This is just a listing of coaches for the following year, correct? I'd like to change that motion to approve the coaches and advisors just for the fall. Okay. For 2024-25 school year. And bring back the winter and spring. Just do fall only. <coughs> I'll make that motion. Okay. So I have a motion. I'll need a second for it. I'll second it. 
That was right at the same time. Uh, at the same time. <laughs> okay, Cindy. All right, Cindy. Cindy's turn. Okay. I have a motion by Marsha Franek, seconded by uh, uh, Cindy Fleecek, to approve the coaches and advisors for the fall of the 24-25 school year. Correct? Yep. To get that right. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed. Motions passed. Seven zero. Uh, next, we have fundraisers for the 24 25 school year. I'll need a motion to approve those. Any comments or questions about them? I'll make the motion. No second. All right, I have a motion by Marsha Franek, seconded by Cindy Fleecek, uh, to approve the 24 25 fundraisers. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motions passed 7 0. Overnight trips for 24 25 school year. I'll pull those up here. Just a listing of the overnight trips. I will seek a motion to approve the 24 25 overnight trips. I'll make a motion. Oh. I hear that motion. I heard, I heard it. Nice job. And Chris, that was you? Yes. Motion by Kevin Huber, seconded by Chris Wessock to approve the 24-25 overnight trips. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motions passed, 7-0. Activity book updates for 24-25. Any comments on this one other than just the general updates? Was there any changes? The, uh, Major, I guess, no, it's pretty, pretty simple. I can share them real quick. Um, He's got him in green as well. Ten, oh. Obviously a new tennis coach. Uh, they want to start up a fellowship for Christian athletes, which doesn't cost. Um, as a new club type thing. Uh, admission fees are going from 6 and $4 to 7 and 5 And then you can see through the conference, there's also a senior citizen one uh, for $3. So that's a change. He does have farther down in green, if I could go on. Uh, transportation policy hasn't changed. I'm not sure why that's in green. Okay. So. And then outside of that, there are no other changes. Okay. So just basically the, the pricing and then a coach change. Yep. So I'll seek a motion then. I'll make a motion. I have a motion by Hillary Birdsell, seconded by Cindy Fleecheck to approve the 2425 activities handbook. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motions passed 7-0. Okay, uh, corporate resolution for MNDCP. So is this, this is just to allow you as the... Yeah. Because we're changing it from January yeah. right yeah. to... Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, they're new, new? Yeah, these are brand new. Oh, these, these are, are the new ones? The new ones. Okay. So the new ones you put Kevin on are still the old one and the old ones. And if we need to... They aren't resolved or closed out by the time I'm done. But at the next board meeting, we would bring those. Okay. Have Kevin be listed All right. as the person. Yeah. All right. Be it, re be it resolved that the school, that the board of directors of Tri City United School District hereby authorize Kevin Babcock, superintendent, to act on behalf of the organization in all matters related to the acceptance and receipt of the death benefit payable under the life insurance policy of Archie C. Delighton including signing any necessary documents, forms, or agreements under policy number 515-740-9073. I'll second it. <clears throat> All right, I have a resolution, resolution introduced by Chris Vosak, which was seconded by Marsha Franek. This will be a roll call vote. Hillary? Yes. Marsha? Yes. Chris? Yes. I'm a yes. Trevor? Yes. Kevin? Yes. And Cindy? Yes. Motion's passed, 7 0. Chris, you want to move on to the next one? Be it resolved that the <coughs> Board of Directors of Tri City United School District hereby authorizes Kevin Babcock, superintendent, uh, to act on behalf of the organization in all matters related to the acceptance and receipt of the death benefit payable under the life insurance policy of Archie C. Delighton, including signing any necessary documents, forms, or agreements under policy number 536 300. 04459. I'll need a second. Also. 
All right, Chris Vlasak introduced the resolution, which was seconded by Kevin Huber. This will be another roll call vote. Hillary? Yes. Marsha? Yep. Chris? Yes. Josh is a yes. Trevor? Yes. Kevin? Yes. And Cindy? Yes. Resolutions passed 7 0. Be it resolved that the Board of Directors of Tri City United School District hereby authorizes Kevin Babcock, Superintendent, to act on behalf of the organization in all matters related to the acceptance and receipt of the death benefit payable under the life insurance policy of RGC Delighton, including signing any necessary documents, forms, or agreements under policy number S0001553. Six. <laughs> I'll second it. All right. Resolution was introduced by Chris Vlasak, seconded by Marsha Franick. Another roll call vote. Uh, Hillary? Yes. Marsha? Yes. Chris? Yes. I am a yes. Trevor? Yes. Kevin? Yes. And Cindy? Yes. Motion's passed 7 0. All right. Parking lot. Our parking lot abatement bond awarding resolution. Yes. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say I did include the tax impact um, for the parking lot bond sale. So this is accepting, basically accepting the bond sale. Um, and it has the impact below. Um, you can see that actually some of them are negative. Um, I just wanted to comment on that for, for the former 394 district. Um, so there was a, the tax impact for homestead residential properties is reduced due to the homestead market value exclusion. So there was a formula change um, that was changed statutorily um, for taxes payable 25. So what this chart is showing you is like the impact of the abatement bond that's going in plus the tax market exclusion um, that happened that went in through legislation or statutorily changed um, so it's like the impact of the the new bond plus the credit for that exclusion on all bonds so thanks Jean yeah Just kind of a $1,085,000 in general obligation tax abatement bond series 2024A, ratifying the award of sale and prescribing the form and detail and providing for the payment thereof. I need a second. I'll second. All right, I have a Resolution introduced by Chris Vlasak um, for the parking lot abatement bond awarding resolution, uh, which was seconded by Hillary Birdsell. This will be another roll call vote. Hillary? Yes. Marsha? Yep. Chris? Yes. Josh is a yes. Trevor? Yes. Kevin? Yes. And Cindy? Yes. Motion's passed 7 0. Next, we have a Southwest Metro long-term facility maintenance levy. Okay, um, I'll cover the next two resolutions just in one comment here. So this is just our annual work that we do um, uh, that I bring forward to the board. So this is, I'm recommending for your approval, two resolutions pertaining to Tri-State United's membership in the Southwest Metro Co-op, so the long-term facility maintenance and the safe schools. So TCU is, a, is one of 11 members and four associate member districts in the Southwest Metro Co-op. Um, as per Minnesota statute, co-ops and intermediate districts are able to access LTFM and safe school funds. In order for Southwest Metro to access these funds, each member's district must acknowledge annual approval through this resolution. So this will mean that this will show up on the TCU levy, and then it is like a pass through to the Southwest Metro district, and they allocate it based upon like your percentile percentage of services so that's how they split it up between the different school districts so I do include there just some history um, so the the LTFM has declined because they've kind of invested in newer buildings so that makes sense you don't need as much LTFM when you have newer buildings um, so you can see kind of where we were at one point to 
back in 20,000, back in pay 21 was 20,000, now it's nine, so. or comments? Uh, this is a resolution approving Southwest Metro Intermediate School District number 288's long-term facility maintenance program budget and authorizing the inclusion of a proportionate share of those projects in the district's application for long-term facility maintenance revenue. Can okay, I need a second? I'll show We have a resolution introduced by Chris Blussock regarding Southwest Metro long-term facility maintenance levy, uh, which was seconded by Kevin Huber. This will be a roll call vote. Hillary? Yes. Marsha? Yep. Chris? Yes. Josh is a yes. Trevor? Yes. Kevin? Yes. And Cindy? Yes. Resolution is passed 7-0. Chris, you want to move right on to the next one? I'd like to introduce a resolution approving <laughs> Southwest Metro's Intermediate School District number 288's Safe School Program and authorizing the inclusion of a proportionate share of this program in the district's application for safe school revenue. I'll second it. Okay. Uh, Chris Flussock introduced the Southwest Metro Safe School Levy, uh, seconded by Marsha Fronick. This will be a roll call vote. Hillary? Yes. Marsha? Yep. Chris? Yes. Josh is a yes. Trevor? Yes. Kevin? Yes. And Cindy? Yes. Motions passed 7 0. 24 budget revisions. Yeah, great. Um, Thanks. Okay, so Superintendent Babcock, members of the board, I'm requesting your approval of the 24, FY24 revised budget for the Tri-City United School District. Um, it was built with input from the administrators of our building sites, departments, and programs, and falls within the framework and recommendations of the Finance Committee. So this is for the fiscal year 24, which began on July 1st, 2023, and ends here in this month, June 30th, 2024 and it consists of five funds. Um, with a revised budget, the starting balance will be the actual for fiscal year 23, so that's a change from the adopted budget. Um, and revenue estimates are based upon state, local, and federal funding sources, as well as other local revenue. Expenditure estimates are based upon projected staffing and programming as approved by the school board, and also assumptions of operational expenditures. Um, so I'm just gonna highlight a couple of things on this one um, so from going down for fund one so fund one is kind of the general fund that accounts for k-12 educational activities instruction and student support so kind of the main things that people think about when they think about a school um, so the 24 revised budget estimate includes enrollment oh i wrote that twice Enrollment at enrollment um, at 1889 ADMs or 20, 2,069 APUs. So this is a this is a decline from what I had projected um, with the 24 adopted. Enrollment is an estimate. It feels like it should be really simple. It's not. So um, this is this is a, not a huge difference, but um, a little bit of a drop from where I had projected at the start of for the start of the year. Um, it has a revised Gosh, I have a lot of duplicates. An estimated unassigned fund balance of 26.9%, um, which is an improvement um, from the 24 adopted budget. Um, it does have a, the 24 revised budget estimates a total fund one deficit of $700,000, um, which is an improvement from the adopted budget. However, it does have a $50,000 surplus in unassigned. So we can kind of look in the, the um, board, you have a packet. You have two packets, one for 24 and one for 25. That's the same documents that are attached um, to the board agenda. Um, but if you want, I wanted to point out a couple of things. Um, so the revised budget on unassigned is improved due to one-time funding sources, um, including utility rebates for efficiency improvements, improved interest earnings at the market rates, sale of property and equipment, including our auction, and then the death benefit of alumni, Archie Delighton. So that's one of the 
key drivers of the improved budget from the adapted to the revised. Um, so those are wonderful things um, that are really helping us out, but they're not continuing. So that's an important note. Um, and then the other thing to point out is we have a restricted fund spend down. So um, in school finance, we have buckets of what we can spend. We have our funds. And then even within the funds, we have smaller buckets of things that are regulated and how you can spend them. And that's where we're seeing a lot of our spend down um, in fiscal year 24. So it reflects an increased spend down in long-term facility maintenance, or LTFM, due to district in initiatives and unanticipated projects, and also spend down in our operating capital due to investment in student data support tools and curriculum supports, some of which will not be renewed for the 24-25 fiscal year. Um, so we kind of detailed some of that. If you drop down in the one of the restricted funds um, of that deficit, the operating capital was 270k of spend down. Um, that so Lida kind of touched on it too in her teaching and learning presentation. But there's been a lot of work done by her um, to go through this, and we've cut that down by half for fiscal year 25, which I'll present next. Um, so really working on kind of reining that back in and making sure that we have funds to support. Um, investments in future curriculum. And then basic skills is a 164K deficit. So I, just a reminder, we've talked about this for several years, but I only really talked to you about it once or twice a year, so just say it again. Um, we built up our basic skills fund balance during COVID when we had ESSER funding, um, because we knew that was one time. And so we built up our basic skills funds to help us um, when we came to like the fiscal cliff of ESSER funding ending. And so this is kind of part of that planned spend down. Obviously you can't do it forever, but it helps you um, for a while. So you're just kind of get, trying to get to the next lily pad a little bit. Um, and then LTFM. So I'm projecting a $420,000 deficit for district wide pro um, projects and initiatives. So just a reminder, part of this is that our LTFM revenue was reduced this year because of the 22 um, LTFM bond that we did that was for deferred maintenance and indoor air quality. So we used about 40% of our LTFM revenue to fund that $5.3 million project. And then part of that came from taxpayers and part of that came from we borrowed forward against our LTFM revenue. So we'll have that for 10 years. So that's, if we hadn't done that project, we'd have more projects to do but we also would have probably not have been in deficit spending for LTFM, or not to this degree. So um, JAV has worked really hard to create a really good plan for fiscal year 25. That'll be, you know, it's kind of his first plan year that he gets to be in control of the projects that are coming forward. It's leaner because you can't keep spending down $400,000 in a year, um, but it's kind of got the list, the, the list of must-dos on it. And... Um, catching up with some of our inspections and things. So um, those are kind of some of the key drivers of the spend down. Um, another thing to comment on, our, our biggest drivers are all in budgets are always enrollment and then staffing because enrollment drives our funding and staffing is by far our largest line item for expenditures. Um, and, you know, yeah, I'll say that. For food, for food service, um, that's fund two, so that's its own fund. So projecting a deficit of 70K in food service, but this does include 100 and 123,000 in kitchen equipment investment. So we do have a healthy fund balance in food service. Food service is not just, food service funds not just for TCU, but for districts across the state where really, um, really saw a lot of benefit during COVID time and the federal investment in meals. And so one thing that's been really great about that is it's allowing us to go through kind of our inventory of kitchen equipment and be doing some more major replacements. Because as you can imagine, industrial food prep is very expensive. So um, Amy and I have been working on creating like a, a long-term um, list of inventory items so that we won't have this good healthy fund balance in food service forever. Food service should really just operate on a you know, self-sufficient. Um, but we're really lucky to have built it up so we can be working on getting, um, you know, replacing some of that expensive equipment. So we're really grateful for that. Um, 
but that's been that's been a good blessing for us. Um, and then in community service or community education for Fund Four, um, that's planned at a surplus of twenty eight thousand um, dollars, which is an improvement from a slight surplus that we had at the adopted budget. So a reminder that community ed earns sixty percent of their funding from tuition because. The remaining funds is from state aid and local levy and various grants and donations, and those amounts have not really changed in the seven years that I've been looking at community ed budgeting. So as things get more expensive, more and more money has to come from fees and tuition. Um, so most community ed programs run at a very low margin or in the negative, um, but the purpose of community ed is community involvement and continued and expanded education for all ages. And then other community ed programs, particularly KidZone, are more profitable. And together, these programs result in a self-sustaining community ed department. Um, another shift we're seeing in community ed is we are running more programs through community ed. Um, and so we kind of see both the revenues and the expenditures rise through that. So more, more organizations are running their registrations through community ed. So community ed takes in that revenue and then um, less their fee pays that out to the program. So it's kind of just a shift that's been happening in the community ed budget. Um, the building construction fund, which is fund six. So um, this includes continued spend down of the $5.3 million deferred maintenance or LTFM and de the deferred maintenance and IAQ bond. Um, and then it also includes the spending estimates for the $1.1 million abatement bond for the park to repair the district's parking lots. Um, I don't have a good sense of when the work will, like how much of the work for the abatement bond will be done, but it's gonna split 24 and 25. It's, that, those are really tricky when you're doing summer projects of like what's gonna fall in June and what's gonna fall in July. So just expect shifts there. Um, but it'll have to fall within the amount allotted, so it's not when we, like, the fiscal year doesn't worry as much on that one. And then debt services fund seven, um, so that's just purely for the annual payment, the annual payments of principal and interest on the district's funds. And just as a reminder, um, we do have a bond that um, will have a continue to grow in anticipation of a two thousand. 2027 payment on the district's 2010 A bond, um, which is structured as a sinking fund. So we collect that taxpayer money, we put it into an account, it's earning interest, and then that'll be used to make like one big balloon payment on this bond in 2027. That's why the balance continues to grow. All right, so that's the 24 revised budget. Does anyone have any questions? Talk about the uh, food fund. Yeah. You know, run self-sufficient basically. I yeah. Mean, we have the same attitude with community ed. Yeah. That's the goal of community ed is to be self-sufficient. So some districts do it differently. Um, I know of other districts that have done community ed and a deficit to do like preschool programming for free because that's a great enrollment enticement, right? So if you get kids at preschool, then you're likely more likely to get them at kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And then those districts do do a fund transfer from fund one to fund four, which would have to go through a school board. But that's just been some districts have had that type of like a strategy. I know as just like TCU, um, almost every district is really struggling on fund one, um, which I think is just basically common <laughs> knowledge that school districts are facing. But that, that kind of program then really gets pinched in that sort of time, right? Because now you don't have your fund one to cover fund one, let alone to cover fund four expenses. So it's a great strategy, but um, in terms of for your future enrollment, but it can be difficult when your fund one um, balances get lower. Yeah, but otherwise for TCU, it's always been that we'd be self-sufficient. And we've, we've seen a big, from when I started to now, like the huge revenue that's come in from from Kids Zone has really helped um, community ed grow. Because they used to be deficit every year. And Lane is <laughs> Lane's no, a very conservative good. planner, um, which is great. I don't have to worry about him so much, but <laughs> he doesn't like ever seeing a deficit. Um, but it's like you can't only build, so it's okay to invest. You know, if you're investing, like kind of what you're talking about with food service, right? Like we have a spend down, but. We're, we know what, what it's for. It's not for operations as much as it's for like those big equipment purchases. So we have to we have to build that, 
keep build a plan to spend that down over a course of years to make sure that our you know our equipment's working because the kids are coming down for lunch you know it's ever happening every day we got to make sure it's up and running and then also <coughs> like with food service it's one of the areas where work comp is one of the bigger concerns um, and so we want to make sure that you're you know you have things that are keeping people safe because it is, it is a very physically demanding position our job so yes that's the that's the goal of community I thought to be self-sufficient yeah okay I need a motion to approve the revisions to the fiscal year 24 budget I'll make the motion is that you, Chris? Yes. All right, I have a motion by Marsha Franek, seconded by Chris Wasak, uh, to approve the revisions to the t fiscal year 24 budget. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion's passed 7 0. Moving on to the 25 adopted budget. Okay, great. Um, so, Superintendent Babcock, members of the board, I'm requesting for your approval of the fiscal year 25 budget for the Tri-State United School District. This budget was built with input from administrators in our building sites, departments, and programs, and falls within the framework of the recommendations of the Finance Committee. Um, the fiscal year 25 fiscal year be begins July 1, 2024, and ends June 30th, 2025. It consists of five funds. Um, the budget starting balance is the fiscal year 24 revised budget estimate ending balance. So this is the budget, when you're doing an adopted budget, you are doing it based upon an estimate. So this is always the one that like reminds me of that song that I had to sing when I was a kid of like, the wise man built his rock upon the stone, but this is like, build your rock upon the sand a little bit. So it's like you're building your estimate on an estimate. So it'll be another, depending on where fiscal year 24 actually ends, will impact the fiscal year 25 budget as well. Um, so it's uh, revenue estimates are based on state, local, and federal funding sources as well as local revenue. Um, so I just always like to plug in that budgets are always estimates based upon assumptions. Um, I attempt to present assumptions contained in this budget and how those assumptions will need to be revised in the 24-25 school year. Um, okay, so we'll jump right in. So. Going into fund one again. So the fund one budget summary uses an estimated enrollment at 1,891 ADM, and it has an estimated unassigned fund balance of 19.6%. Um, so the budget for the enrollment of 1891, that is a de slight decrease from where I have us for, um, or no, it's flat. It's flat to the revised budget. Um, but we do have a very promising kindergarten um, enrollment. So this is the like largest kindergarten enrollment that I think we've had in four or five years. So we're like in the 140s. We've been in like the 120s to 130s the last five years or so. So that's really great um, as we have some of our largest classes at the high school level. So um, not only does that put pressure on the high school, but it also means that those are kiddos are graduating out. So if we're not replacing them with similar sized grades, that's going to be an enrollment decline which is something that we kind of have talked about for a couple of years here coming. So very promising to see a kindergarten class in the 140s. I will, as I leave this role, I will always be looking to see if we're in the 140s or 150s. That'll be a really great sign. So, <laughs> um, All right, so this fund, um, fiscal year 25 budget estimates a total fund deficit of $1.5 million. Um, and that is mostly in the unassigned fund, which is different than what we were talking about in the revised budget. So the unassigned fund deficit is a $1.2 million deficit. So drivers include, um, first I call out enrollment. So we have had flat enrollment with some <coughs> fluctuations. Um, and I mentioned the bright spot of the 24-25 kindergarten enrollment. Um, but because of the second item, the state funding formula increase for fiscal year 25 is plus 2%, which calculates to an approximately $320,000 of funding increase. That falls far short of the cost increases due to inflationary forces. Um, and this is our funding item is the majority of funding for public school districts. So the increase that we got from the state of 2% is not on all of state, the whole state funding. It's on a portion of the state funding that were awarded, the biggest portion, but still only a portion. So 
a 2% increase, this doesn't even cover, I mean, it doesn't even cover some of our individual vendors. Um, if you think we have 270 staff members, if you divided 320 by 270, you get to like 1,100. If someone was paid $50,000 and they got an $1,100 increase, it would only be a 2.4% package increase. Um, and that's not very competitive either. So, and that would be if every bit of this went to staff. And we know that, like I said, individual vendors are increasing by more than this. So this is, the, this is where districts are really struggling, not just TCU. Um, uh, staffing increases, so our staff count has increased by nearly 25 FTE compared to five years ago, um, while enrollment has been flat with some fluctuations. So there's a lot of reasons why we've increased staff, um, special education needs, we've done program expansion, we've added interventionists, and we've added administrative support. Um, so those are kind of some of the main drivers. I, did, I listed it under inflationary forces, but um, a one individual call out that I could have maybe highlighted a little bit more is just like our vendor increases. We've had a lot of 20, like two digit percentage increases on vendors, including um, we're gonna be talking about like our risk insurance renewal. That's at 15% or I think it's at 10% or 15, yeah, 10%. You know, we know Palmer came in last year at like 12 to 16 percent depending upon the line item so those types of things um, are putting a lot of pressure on um, what we are able to do um, other areas uh, we had three hundred thousand dollar deficit in restricted funds um, so restricted funds can only be used for prescribed purposes written in state statute so we have some spend down in staff development um, operating capital I just wanted to highlight that that's a hundred and thirty thousand dollars spend down um, so like I said that was that's half of what we're doing in 24, so that's coming off of the, the work that Allied is doing to really streamline um, what we're <coughs> investing in. And then basic skills, so again, spending down another 150,000. I kind of touched on how we built up that fund balance during ESSER for this purpose to help us in leaner years. Um, again, our most critical drivers are enrollment and staff benefits and salaries. Um, I did want to touch on benefits, we've seen big increases in our health insurance costs. Over the past two years, our premiums have increased 60%. Um, so that's another, that's another line item that is difficult when you get 2% from the state, but you have 60% insurance increase. You know, the school's trying to make up a gap to be a competitive employer. However, um, there's only so much you can do and then the rest you know, but that, those are some really difficult forces that we're dealing with. Um, um, I'll, I want to touch on food service and community ed like I did in the other ones, and then we can come back to fund one to have more conversation if you'd like. So food service is planned at a deficit of 20K. Um, there is minimal kitchen equipment planned for fiscal year 25. Um, I, am rec I am working on doing a change in how we're allocating expenses to fund two, both in fiscal year 24 and in fiscal year 25, um, by allocating up, it's, you have to do it on a calculation that's approved by the state, but I'm allocating more funds from fund one to fund two than I have in the past as one of the ways that I'm trying to um, help fund one. And fund two has a healthy fund balance. so. Um, that's one of the drivers of the change. Um, free meals are still in effect for next year. There's no, that's a permanent program unless legislation um, acts in a different way. Foods, our community ed, um, this is also planned at a deficit of 41,000. Um, and kind of the same conversation we had on community ed before, but they do have a healthy fund balance, so I'm not overly concerned and um, at this time with that deficit spending in, in community ed. Uh, building construction, so that's planned with spending estimates for the, the abatement bond only. Um, again, expect fluctuations if it falls in June or July, which fiscal year it's gonna hit on, and then debt service is fund seven, and that's just the annual principal and interest payments on district bonds. Um, so going back to fund one, 
um, take any questions that you have. There are some things that, that we can do that maybe the, the finance, that I'll recommend to the finance committee at our next meeting um, in terms of we do have a healthy assigned fund balance and one of the things that we've earmarked the assigned fund for is to help um, in deficit spending times. So we can shift from assigned to unassigned um, as we go. You, you, again, can't do it forever. You're spending from your savings. So um, as we look forward, there's two levers you can pull. You can get more revenue or you can spend less money. Those, you know, we all know from our own lives, <laughs> those are the two levers that you have. So I'm really excited about the class size for kindergarten. Um, but those are things that we need to, those are numbers that we need to even maintain where we are because we are, for the next four, three or four years, graduating our, our largest classes. So even bringing in those good kindergarten class sizes is a maintenance level. Um, but it's still good. It's still showing that some of the programs that we've invested in that also are contributing to this, um, these figures are, are hopefully um, enticing more, more families to choose TCU. Any questions or anything, guys? Okay. If not, I'll seek a motion. Thanks, Jean. Yeah. I have a motion by Marsha Kronick, seconded by Cindy uh, Fleecek, to approve the revisions to the, to, excuse me, to approve the fiscal year 25 budget. So all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motions passed 7 0. Next we have risk insurance renewal. Our annual risk insurance renewal process. Um, so Superintendent Babcock, members of the board, I'm recommending for your approval the 2425 insurance and risk management policy <coughs> renewal. The combined proposal is an increase in annual premium of $28,666 or approximately 10% for a total cost of $309,000. Um, this is a f I should have taken out very. That was right from last year. This is a favorable renewal in the sense that the average increase for school districts is 15 to 30 percent this year. So they were happy that we were under that, but it's still, again, <laughs> got, kind of going back to the last conversation, um, a 10 percent increase. Um, so this is, this just this will be 10 percent of that state funding that we got. Um, that state funding increase will get eaten up by just this one policy. So this plan runs from July 1, to 24 to June 30, 25. Um, under this proposal, we will remain with Marsh McLennan as the agency on record. Um, and I am recommending a change in our insurance carrier for property liability and auto to right specialty. So we were previously at right specialty. We went to EMC, and now I'm recommending going back to right specialty. Um, both bids were like right within the same amount of money, um, but our agent really recommended moving back to right specialty, looking kind of at a longer range outlook for. Um, services so no change not recommending any changes to our work comp insurance or our cyber insurance carriers um, uh, those are a couple of bright spots so we we were hit um, on the cyber side and then have seen large premiums that did come down this year by three thousand dollars on the cyber side <laughs> because we've implemented the things and we're a few years out so that was really promising on the work comp side um, we we chose I don't even remember. And we were still in the band room when we did it. I remember I was, but so it was a number of years ago, we switched to CF SFM for, um, for work comp. They are more expensive, but we have seen that come back. It's been a great investment because it's really helped with our claims and the processing, and um, they're much more proactive on getting, <coughs> getting staff back to work and getting staff back in the building, so um, that really cuts down. Even if it's just on light duty, even if you're just supervisory, um, that really cuts down on your work claim costs, and so we are still under, we're at like a 0.8. Um, so anything under a 1.0 for your EMOD is good, so we used to be at, we were at a 1.4 when I started. So we've went down to a 1.7. We had a we had a claim a larger claim last year that brought us up to a 0.8, but still under the 1.0. So that's good. Um, 
I did include the renewal packet for the board only to see the full list of, of what it is. I do want to make sure that the board's aware um, that one of the areas that's really getting pinched is on hail and storm damage. Um, so this overall does increase just on regular claims, increases our deductible from 5000 to 25000 so now basically you're self-insured on any claims under $25,000. Um, it would be, it would cost about about $10,000 to keep our $5,000 deductible. So over two years you're maybe paying for it. I don't know. Um, uh, but that does not include hail damage. We will have $100,000, $100,000 deductible per instance on hail damage. We are in a severe area for hail damage according to the people that do these things. Um, and some districts are being forced to even have a 1% of their building value as their deductible for storm damage. So our insurance agent says $100,000 deductible is actually good, which is again like him telling me the 10% increase is good because it's not 15. <laughs> Um, so just just want to make sure everybody is aware of that. I've I've told people already, but just want to make sure more voices understand that if there's a hail claim, that there's a very high deductible, and that may be another area that continues to get pushed in future renewals um, up to that one percent um, of building value being your deductible. So um, that is one of the reasons why the recommendation for going to right specialty is that he thinks that they'll have better policies on that going forward like in a future renewal so um, yeah that's anything anybody have any questions okay thanks Jean yeah okay I'll seek a motion I'll wait for I'll second All right, I have a motion by Chris Flussock, seconded by Hillary Birdzell to approve the 2024-2025 insurance and risk management policy renewals. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion's passed, 7-0. Okay, next I will uh, entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. I'll make a I have a motion by Kevin Huber, seconded by Cindy Fleecheck, to adjourn the meeting at 7.27 p.m. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion's passed, 7-0.